Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking with the founder of what is known as Heart IQ. We're going to be discussing something known as Humanity 3.0, which is a vision for living cooperatively in interdependent, heart-connected communities. But in order to realize this vision, we need to make it a critical update to our operating system so that we can be with each other in a more healthy, harmonious way. We'll also discover how we can download this update and install it into our nervous system, which is called it Heart IQ. And during this interview, we're going to learn the essential ingredients of this integrative framework. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest, Christian Pankhurst. Christian, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Mm, my pleasure. I'm so now, happy tell to be us, here. what is Humanity 3.0? Well, as you so beautifully summarized, it is a way for us to be together um, that is interdependent. So how do we activate our heart intelligence so that we can define ourselves beyond just us, but to include others as well, and to live in a, a collective, a cooperative that actually really opens and sustains and feels absolutely like coming home and it feels absolutely right. So it's a vision um, that I hold of what's possible, of what I know to be um, a possibility that we can, we can create because over the last few years and developing these models of communication and the language of heart-centered communication, we've been able to create um, especially here in the Netherlands at our own Heart IQ Retreat Center, the home of Heart IQ, we've been able to experiment with different ways of connecting and being together. And we've actually been able to um, realize this vision. And now it's a question of, okay, we now have something that could totally, utterly, radically change the world. Let's insert this into communities and ignite them um, internationally. So that's what's really, really exciting. Now, it's interesting when you think of interdependent relationships, especially here in the United States where we seem to revere independence, you know, kind of doing things on our own. Uh, tell us, the, can you explain the myth of what independence is? Yeah, well, I, I call it a myth in that independence is a wonderful stage to growth, and it's so important that as we move away from dependency, that we can stand on our own two feet, we can feel we have influence, we can make choices that feel like we're making an impact. So the level of control we have over our own lives is so important and it's huge. And yet we can get overly dependent, ironically, on independence. And that is we stay stuck there. We actually think, okay, now I'm complete. I'm whole. I've got a good job. My health is okay. I've got an okay relationship. Abundance is coming in. All right, I'm taking care of myself. And yet there's a limitation of how open we can be, how, how deep we can go and how far our life can take us in that way. And we're not designed to be alone. We are interdependent creatures by nature and we're not islands. So this myth of independence is that somehow it's the highest ideal to think that that's the, the ultimate destination. And what I want to encourage is that it's actually a bridge to something far more powerful, something far more invigorating, opening, and connecting, and that is living interde interdependently, where we, in fact, acknowledge and honor the fact that we do, in fact, have needs, and we need one another. And often in a lot of personal development, spirituality uh, circles, there's almost like, oh, no, I don't want to have needs. I don't want to be needy. And there's this shadow almost around having needs. And yet, when we look at it, everything that we have and everything that we experience on the world today is interdependent. And we are so connected to one another in ways that are um, really, really clear. But sometimes when we're living our day-to-day -day lives, we can be disconnected from just how much things are interconnected. So, yeah, that, that, that's the myth of it, is where people stay stuck in their independence and then they, um, they, they, they don't feel beyond themselves or their own limited family and friends. It, it kind of stays quite localized. Like a, the analogy I give is, imagine a computer back in the 80s that had 
a certain degree of programming and it had a hard drive full of data and it could only do what the programming um, was basically enabling it to do. It couldn't go outside of that programming. It could only draw on the experiences that were stored in that hard drive. So it's very independent. It's alone. It's isolated. Um, it has what it has. It does what it does. And it goes where it goes. And then something amazing happened like 20 years ago when we were able to upgrade these computers and hook them up to the internet. So now these isolated computers start to connect to a wide world network. And now, instead of having just information accessible to their local hard drive, they now can access almost unlimited information um, through this vast internet. And what I'm speaking about here is that possibility that I'm not talking about socialism or a political system or trying to um, create new ways of living together, because I call that hardware solutions. I'm talking about upgrading software, our consciousness. I'm talking about literally giving people the, the upgrade which allows them to see that their nervous system isn't just meant to be wired individually, but it can be wired as a group consciousness and that there's wisdom, there's intelligence in the field of a group and that the group consciousness is so much more powerful than the individual. And whether you call that the inner net amplified field, circle wisdom, group wisdom, whatever you want to call that, there is a power that comes with us coming together. Why do you think people come together and brainstorm or have think tanks? But what about the heart tank? What about the place where we can really come together and through opening our hearts and connecting emotionally, energetically together and syncing up our nervous systems, what possible solutions can we start to feel into that aren't possible from an individual independent standpoint of looking at the world from an, our own vantage point? Does that make sense? It does, actually. It's uh, quite interesting when you think about uh, people all being connected to, say, together because it is more powerful than the individual. And you think about you know, something, for instance, uh, who was it, uh, McTaggart, Lynn McTaggart actually talked about the intention experiments where people would collectively get together, you know, with a singular intention to magnify the power of what that actually is. And it was pretty fascinating mm -hmm. when she was conducting those experiments. Uh, I think that was about 10 years ago. And I was wow. curious, uh, let's talk a little bit about, high, before we go into the core of the components of the Heart IQ operating system, let's talk about what Heart IQ is. Yeah, Heart IQ is, in a very, very simplistic way, a method to open hearts. So it's a language that allows people to communicate, from, firstly, to themselves. So we've got to imagine that most people really aren't that intimate with themselves. They're, not, they're quite disconnected on the whole. Of course, there's you know, vast exceptions to that rule, but generally... Uh, we are distracted. Um, we often will find ways to numb, to check out, to distance, to disconnect from our own pain, from our own wounding, from our own dysfunction, uh, our own loneliness and neglect and trauma and the rest of it. And that's natural, it's expected. And so, mo and also just our modern day culture, it keeps us separated from who we really are, and each other. So technology, although it's a blessing, can we get addicted to it? Can we get over, you know, stimulated by it? Absolutely. So we, we, we have this disconnection to our essence, to who we really are, to our value, to our goodness, to, to just being human again, um, being childlike, being in nature, whatever you want to call that. There are so many examples where we're just not as connected as we could be. So Heart IQ, first of all, is a system of inner awakening and introspective awareness. So how do we get, how do we get to get back into connection with this thing called us? How can we feel us again? How can we feel alive and in our joy and in our vibrancy and in our juice? So that's the first component of Heart IQ is, is self, connection with self. And from that place is connection with other. So it's this balance of vertical and horizontal development. And by vertical, um, the best way to describe that is often those people who 
uh, advocate, you know, a spiritual life of meditation and prayer and solitude and isolation. I, I would call them very vertically connected. They've got a very strong connection to source. Uh, some people might call that God. Whatever you want to name that as, there's a vertical up connection to spirit. Um, and also downward into the ground, into the earth, into nature. But, you know, we all know that somebody can be very vertically connected and have almost zero relationship skills. You know, the, the, the image of, you know, the guru sitting on the mountaintop um, meditating for hours perfectly, but he can't get on with his own parents. You know, that kind of image comes to mind. But likewise, there's also this horizontal layer of reality which is your relationship to others. And when you're talking about relationship to others, there's always two important criteria. Can you receive love from another? And can you speak your truth and dare to share all of who you are to another? Those are, those are the two criteria for healthy um, heart-centered communication and intimacy development. Is Can you express all of you? And can you let others all in? And most of us receive poorly. We prefer to give. In fact, we use giving as a way to avoid receiving. So the art of Heart IQ is to connect ourselves vertically and horizontally. It's a language. It's an internal um, methodology and philosophy that allows us to be simultaneously grounded, connected to source, letting others in, and being true and vulnerable and authentic and expressing all of who we are to others. And that combination of vertical and horizontal together is very unique in the kind of personal development, awakening space and industry because most people will prioritize one over the other. But where you get an integration of all four of those directions, all four of those components together is, is really, really beautiful. It creates a powerful integrated human being. So um, that's probably enough <laughs> just to describe that aspect of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Now I understand that you came upon this work by healing your own past. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, back in two, oh no, when was it? Uh, 1997, 98, around that time. So it was a good, good time ago. Um, I was physically uh, attacked outside of a nightclub with my best friend at the time. We were only about 14, 15 years old. And about 13 to 15 guys outside of a nightclub just came out. We just happened to be in, the, in that time of night and in the park. And uh, Long story short, my friend and I got uh, attacked. I was able to get out and run away. We both ran, but he was a bit slower. And they caught him. They dragged him to the ground. And they kicked him in the head repeatedly to such a degree that one more kick to the head would have killed him, the doctor said. Now, he recovered, but I didn't. I didn't have any physical wounding, but I saw it. I saw every single kick. I, saw the, I heard the screams. I saw the blood. I saw the broken face and the, 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 the disfigurement of my best friend, who was my brother. Now, of course that does something to your system, that does something to the nervous system, especially at such a young age. Uh, the, the, the lack of safety I felt in my body, the panic attacks, the asthma, um, the fear of now men, the masculine, uh, any form of confrontation, competition. You know, suddenly my world unravels and I'm now recreating it dysfunctionally, creating conclusions where, you know, my reality is being based on a single event. This is common. It happens. It's trauma. We, we all suffer our own wounds and pains. And, you know, there are many people with far deeper and greater experiences. And yet we all are shaped by this. So I've had my own version of it. And so I kind of, what, what, what happened to me is that I came to the world. I, I, I interacted with the world as if I was like expecting them to hurt me, not like me. I was coming at the world with suspicion. So, of course, 
that reality kept on becoming confirmed, confirmed, confirmed. And this, this part of me started to feel very, very guilty for having left my friend and not saving him. I started to fe- create this identity that I wasn't a good person. So was this core unworthiness would grow inside of me, this part of me that says, am I enough? Am I good? Who am I? I started to doubt my intrinsic goodness. So, of course, I created this act, this facade that you know, I was someone other than who I was. I was trying something on. I was pretending. So Hard IQ brought me deeply in touch with my pain in a joyful way. Now, I know that sounds strange because most people don't associate pain with joy, and yet when we touch what's real, it's cathartic, it's liberating. It's when we cover what's real that we create depression. So that's why I always say depression is not um, feeling bad. It's not having access to any feelings, and therefore you know, the feeling of numbness. So in Hard IQ, we, we emphasize feeling everything, not in a dramatic way in the sense of like dwelling in it and getting into the drama of it. I'm talking about feel more, feel more alive, feel more juice, feel more of all of it, and, and converting those things that people call negative into actually positive traits, positive energy. So anger can be used in the body creatively and positively. Rage, grief, sadness, hopelessness, despair, all of it is, in fact, valuable medicine. And so what happened is that, on a practical level, as I started to get in touch with myself more emotionally, more energetically, I started to feel where I was holding the tension, my lack of safety. My heart began to open. I began to unravel the tension or the inauthenticity, the blockages in my system. And eventually, physical symptoms would disappear. My asthma disappeared. My panic attacks disappeared, even though I tried counseling and therapy and all the other stuff. So it took me having to look at my own shadows. It took me having to look at my resistance. I had to ask the question, what am I doing with my pain? How am I distracting myself from it? How am I living my life avoiding it? And so I, I, it, it's a courageous, it's a warrior journey. This isn't for the faint of heart because you know often people... They just want to, you know, they don't want to be aggravated by this stuff. It's like, you know what, I don't want to be reminded. I don't want to, let let me just play golf. Let me just, um, you know, leave me to my nice, comfortable existence. So, yeah, fine. And yet there are people out there who, who, who go out into the world and they see what's normal and they go, this isn't normal. This is so dysfunctional. This isn't going to work. And they can sense inside. They've had a memory from beyond this time for years. People know it when they have it. There's just a sense of like there's more. I know a normal that's different to this. And we're living in crazy times. And I want to go find it. And that's the quest. That's the almost the midlife crisis moment. That's the time when people step up and go, I need to look for something. I, I might have the great job and the great relationship and this and this and this, yet there's something not quite right. There's something missing. Um, so that's, the, that's my personal journey, is a personal of authenticity and actual healing in my body, uh, especially around the asthma um, and the stuff that I realized was so emotionally related. I mean, I started this work as a chiropractor. Um, that was my kind of way in, uh, trained as a medical chiropractor. And I got to see firsthand the impact of physical intervention leading to emotional healing and vice versa. When somebody starts to emotionally, energetically um, feel more, their spine relaxes, opens, and the pain goes away. And uh, there's a direct correlation there. But it goes so much deeper than that. But, yeah. Fascinating stuff. I'll tell you, you know, I'm curious, what do you think creates relationships that work? Um, a relationship that, you know, the environment. Uh, I would say the most important aspect of any couple is the environment that they exist in. And I'm not talking about just a physical environment of their home. I'm talking about having the ingredients of brotherhood and sisterhood to hold the burden of needs that shouldn't be met within the couple. So, for example, a man who doesn't have brothers that he can go to to help digest his doubt, shame, uh, worry, if he brings all that to his relationship, he will not only depolarize it, and, but her, his woman, in this case, just talking about the stereotypical man-woman, of course it could be any configuration, the partner would have to hold 
the deficit and the weight and the burden of that. And it's just, there are certain needs that can only be got through men, for a man. A woman cannot replace that. And when a man starts to think that his needs need to be met through the feminine or through women, that's a real danger. That, that it's not going to create a relationship that lasts. So in Hard IQ, we talk about an expanded integrative framework of intimacy whereby, yeah, you can learn all the best communication techniques, learn about sexual polarity and magnetism and how to open the heart and have really great intimacy. And it matters zero compared to do you have good, healthy brotherhood and sisterhood supporting the environment of that couple in their life? Um, and the same goes, as I said, for, for women. Can they fall into an environment of safety, of praise, of being witnessed and felt by the feminine, by sisterhood that is non-competitive, non-fragmented, um, and is just in a loving space where needs of their feminine heart can be met and they can be filled up so they can bring that fullness back into the relationship. Just like the men could go to their men and activate their presence so they can bring their full presence into the relationship. Now there are two people adding something into the container of their intimacy rather than just feeling like they're isolated and all they have is each other. Recipe for disaster. When all a couple has is each other. What ends up happening is either there's affairs that happen so there's infidelity. They split up and break up. Or becomes two people um, cohabiting as friends, basically. It's like, all right, I'll not call you on your stuff. You don't call me on my stuff. Because then what, what happens is that they try to relax and be comfortable and not trigger each other because it just gets too burdensome. Nobody wants to... It's like two people in the boxing ring but they're no longer fighting. They're in the corners waving at each other. That's, that's where it's got to. It's like we won't, tip on e we won't chip on each other's toes. It's too risky. So I would say you know, there's a lot more to it. I mean, we in Hard IQ train, you know, a lot of my work is in couples speciality uh, and actually building really, really healthy relationships. That's the book that I created, Insights to Intimacy, was all about that. And so... And, and you know, there's a lot that can be done for, in terms of communicating properly and holding each other and the types of techniques and practices that we can do to improve the relationship. But if you're asking me, you know, like, bottom line, what's the most important thing? I would say the foundation is your environment. And it's, it, it becomes important to understand that um, it becomes even more essential if kids are involved to have an extended brotherhood, sisterhood, an extended family community that can hold a family and a community, um, especially when parents, this is where the myth of independence comes right back full circle because parents as a unit will hold this idea that it's their responsibility to take care of the kids. Like, no, it's, it's the 2.4. It's a nuclear family model. That's the way it's meant to be. Oh, my God, it's toxic. That's the most toxic configuration there is, is thinking that mum, dad, kids is the is the isolated, independent unit that is thriving and is the thing that works. Where, and especially, this is shown more evidently when one of the parents, for example, separates. So if it's a single mum or single dad, that feeling of, oh my God, I've got to do it all on my own. There's no help. There's no support. I've got to do the work. I've got to get a job. I've got to, you know, I'm tired. I don't have any energy. I don't have time for myself. I can't take care of myself. And I've got this screaming kid. And now they are putting out this stress and the child picks up on that stress. So in, an, in, a, in a humanity 3.0 community, there's brotherhood, there's sisterhood, there's couples that are being supported by the community, there's, there's the community supporting the couples in raising the children. There is, and, and, and by the way, this isn't new information tribally and ancestrally this happened all the time in enlightened cultures this is the way it's done it's just for whatever reason we've just suddenly bought into this idea that it's better to do it on our own um, and somehow we're fragmented and disconnected from a wider whole and like you mentioned in the US of course you get pockets of intentional communities that are doing it very very differently and are, you know really leading in a vision that is really, really powerful. But for the most part, community is really fragmented there, much more than I would say anywhere else in the world that I've ever visited. I've lived in the US, lived in Europe, lived in Australia, lived in Costa Rica, lived in Panama. Um, and where I live today in Holland, 
it's remarkable um, how community, they, they have a word for it that doesn't even exist in English. This, this sense, it's, um, it's called gezellig, it's this, this, this word that imparts this sense of cozy togetherness. Um, but there's no direct translation. Because it's, and the entire Dutch culture is built on community. They don't have roads and cities built in blocks and built for cars. There are many cities now that have no cars because it's all built for people to be together. It's, it's, it's built circularly. So it's a very advanced um, community culture here in Holland. That's why I love it. That's why I live here. Uh, in America, it's different. It's, it's built for convenience. Um, not community. And it's uh, not bad, it's just a different priority, but it has a consequence. Uh, you know, in, in, in Holland, it's not very convenient. We don't get all the choices that, you know, is available. So it's like, you know, pros and cons there. So it's that community enlarged model of family and relationship that creates the success of relationship. Now, this is not to mean that you can't have a functional relationship without any of this. Yeah, you can have a relationship that's, that works, but there's a functional relationship, and then there's an absolute, vibrant, alive, ah, oh, juicy, extraordinary relationship. So if somebody just wants to be functional, that is, they, you know, they, they basically work together to make the kids <laughs> and to make sure that they go off and do their thing, and you know, we can just be functional. There's no, nothing else needed. I'm not into functionality. I'm into extraordinary living. And how can we come home into a sense of belonging, into what's really, really, what our heart really wants, rather than what we've been conditioned to think is the right way. That's the Makes interesting sense. thing when you think about it, too, is our conditioning and what people have made us come to believe what is the right way in relationships to be and to act. And you realize somehow, inherently inside yourself, there's just something not right about this. <laughs> yes, indeed. I understand that you have, uh, you know, that there's a, a new educational model for uh, children and elders with purpose uh, where you talk about brotherhood and sisterhood. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the vision of Humanity 3.0 has these core ingredients. The first one, as we've spoken about so far, is can we be healthy adults? <laughs> so that means doing our own inner work, our own healing journey. And can we awaken our hearts, which basically means can our hearts be open? And the only way we can open our hearts is to acknowledge how closed they are most of the time. So we learn how to open by watching how we close. So that's step number one, or part number one, or the ingredient number one, is self-intimacy. And then we've got intimacy with others, this horizontal connection, whether it's with friends, whether it's a family, or whether it's a romantic partner, or in fact, anyone, any stranger. In fact, coming from a place of there are no strangers, it's just others cleverly camouflages them, but they're actually us. So really, how can we move about in the world realizing that, you know, I am over there, but it looks like it's somebody different, but it's me over there looking back at me, and they're just camouflaged as them. You know, some, and, and that's a difficult thing to get around, is to, can we walk through life realizing that we're just seeing ourselves cleverly camouflaged as other people all the time? Now, that's easy when we like them, when they're doing good things. But when it comes to the point of seeing things that we don't like, that we reject, that we cast out, that we say no to, then it's harder to embrace. Because one of the core philosophies of Hard IQ is to love what is. And often we're given in life things that we find very difficult to love because it's an opportunity for us to love and to become bigger in our love. So that's the second component is intimacy with self, intimacy with other in relationships. But like you said, we've got this brotherhood and sisterhood components in, in, uh, in this Humanity 3.0 vision as well. And it's not just important for relationship. I think brotherhood is so important because the reason we can war and we can be at so much dissonance and fragmentation uh, and the reason why there's so much pain, especially created by men, is because of the fractured, disconnected heart of men. A man who is open and conscious and connected doesn't rape, doesn't murder, doesn't pillage, doesn't harm the environment, doesn't make choices that would harm. You know, this whole kind of society that is so male power dominant 
it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. And brotherhood is, in fact, a way for the toxic masculinity to, in fact, di digest and unravel and melt so that the core, loving, present masculine heart can reemerge in a healthy, balanced way with the feminine. And sisterhood as well. That there's so much competition. There's so much media. There's so much pressure. There's so much peer pressure. There's so much, you know, comparison and and suspicion between women, like taking my man and looking better and weight and all this body image stuff that can so get in the way of just being sisters, being open, being connected. Dancing, moving, flowing, surrendering safely together. See, uh, a female spiritual practice is not meditation. That's what men do. Uh, that's not the feminine's idea of a good time. Uh, you know, giving women the space to actually deeply connect to their feminine heart rather than their masculine heart is so important, especially in a world where often they're having to run so much masculine energy through their jobs and through all the other stuff. It's really, really important for health and for just vibrancy and success. But the other point that you mentioned or the other component is really important as well, and that is kids. Kids, I think, is probably the biggest part of my purpose. Uh, I do it for the children in terms of I work with adults, I work with couples, I work with brothers and sisters because they're going to make better parents. They're going to touch kids, and those kids are going to learn from a more um, powerful, enlightened being. Because kids, they're taking pictures all the time like a camera. They're not doing what you say. They are feeling what you're holding. And whatever you're repressing, they're going to express. And whatever dynamic you are holding in excess, they will carry the deficit. Basically, your kids are a function of your dysfunction often. And that's okay. I mean, we end up passing on our wounding generationally down the line to our children, and yet our kids are the leaders of tomorrow. And I want children to become heart intelligent because I want leadership tomorrow to be heart intelligent. When you look at what's happening in the world today, the division, whether it's Brexit, Trump, uh, what's going on even in Holland right now with the popularity of divisive, divisive political parties, it's, it's, a fun, it, it, it's, just, it's just what's happening right now. And I, I want to do my part in contributing to a different world, and I see that the long-term play is with the children. It's the education, not fact-finding, large or fact recollection, or having to be in large classrooms of industrialized environments where there's a teacher in front of a room and rows and rows and rows of kids learning absolutely nothing meaningful. Instead, like put them in circle, connect them up, teach them heart intelligence, teach them actually how to connect social, emotional, spiritual skills. Get them to meditate. Help them open. Help them feel and become discerning, clear, wise children. Give them learning that they can follow. The children know what they're interested in. Let them be interested in it. And um, so uh, our vision for creating a hard IQ school is so exciting. It's a little bit further down our roadmap because we're starting one step at a time. Um, but we, we are currently doing what we call family experiences, where we literally bring entire families together for a week, and multiple families hang out, and we work with the children, we work with the parents, we work individually, we work as the, as, the, as the couple. We do a fully integrative experience of showing that family how they can improve the dynamics between them. It's really, really cool. Now, the last part, elders with purpose, this is so important because, you know, Recently, my granddad just died, and it was amazing and heartbreaking. Amazing to see how he was so excited to die. He was so looking forward to it, and he died with such grace, a beer in his hand, literally. It was amazing. And yet, it was heartbreaking because for the previous 10 years, he, could have, he basically didn't do anything. He had no purpose. You see, in our culture, at a certain age, it's almost like, no. Nope, no more use for you. You're not working, so you're not contributing. And yet, he's full of wisdom, full of stories, full of laughter, full of, full of life, but in a different way. And yet, our culture doesn't use that, doesn't use elders for the wisdom that they bring, the softness that they bring, the huge depth of life experience that they bring. And I so yearn for a community vision in Humanity 3.0 where the elders are, are not just put in an old people's home waiting to die, but they feel like 
they are now living fully, often for the first time ever, by contributing to the community in a really profound way. Whether that's taking care of the young so the parents can be let off or the, the hook, or actually contributing to wisdom circles, or nurturing the ground, or holding that ancestral energy. Whatever it is, I just feel that they need purpose. And, our, and, and it's not hard to do. It will just take a small shift in our cultural story to make that happen. So that's that's the, fascinating uh, work that you do here. It's very encouraging to know that someone out there is, like yourself is actually helping people to learn what it means and the importance is to be connected with each other and to be interdependent. Uh, I was curious, Christian, is there a website people can find out more about your work? And I understand that you do workshops, so they might be able to go on there and find out where you might be at and when. Uh, give that out for our listeners, if you could, please. Thank you. Yeah, everything can be found at www.heartiq.com. That's H-E-A-R-T-I-Q.com. And our website's being updated all the time with upcoming events and stuff like that. Well, very good. Thank you so much for being on the program today and enlightening our listeners about all this. This is great stuff. Yeah, my pleasure. It's uh, really good to have the opportunity to um, share my passion. You bet. Thank you again. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and keep updated on what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. 